Good afternoon, everybody. Um, sorry for the slight delay. We had some small technical issues which are now resolved. So welcome to what I think is the fourth of our uh, um, lunchtime uh, science talks here at CBL. Uh, I will be introducing our guest, uh, Dr. Daryl Worthy, in just a moment. Uh, as always, let me just uh, preamble by saying, uh, please uh, use the uh, chat facility to um, answer questions, or rather answer questions, ask questions. Uh, we'll be accumulating these during the course of the talk and I will field them and moderate the questions at the end. But please don't wait to the end to submit questions. Feel free to do so at any time. Second, um, a link will appear in the chat box uh, that will allow you to join us uh, at the end of uh, this presentation for an informal chat with uh, Dr. Worthy. Thank you for sparing the time to do that. Uh, you'll get a link to that and this will take you into a, a regular Teams meeting where everyone can see each other. And just a reminder that our next talk will be on March 22nd uh, when Nancy Dennis from Penn State will be presenting. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Darrell Worthy without further ado. He um, obtained his PhD from uh, University of Texas at Austin in 2010 and then joined the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Te Texas A&M um, um, shortly after receiving his PhD. His career has been at Texas A&M since, since then. He's currently an associate professor and his interests are in learning and decision making using formal mathematical models and theories as a motivator for empirical studies. So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Worthy. All right, thank you for the introduction and um, thank you for having me uh, present here uh, today. Uh, it's very exciting to, to talk about uh, this research. So um, I came up with this title uh, several months ago. Uh, however, um, the, this talk is basically the same thing, but it'll focus on uh, this preprint that uh, we have that's currently uh, under review. So if I was making the title today, I would probably just make it neural representations of gain loss frequency uh, in older and younger adults. Um, uh, but it's the same stuff I, I was planning on talking about. So this is work uh, that I've done uh, in collaboration with David Schneer's lab at UT Austin. We had a joint um, R01 that funded this research. And so um, the scanning was actually done at UT Austin and then uh, we took uh, the data. Uh, Tyler Davis really helped us a lot with the analysis. And then um, Hillary Dawn uh, was a postdoc in my lab. She's now doing another postdoc at David Shank's lab um, at UC University of College London. Uh, so this was a, a combined uh, team effort. Uh, and um, so I'll be I'll be talking about this. Uh, it's kind of complicated uh, research. So at the start, I'll have to introduce kind of several different lines of research that were short sort of um, weaving together in this study and really play those those lines of research played kind of different roles um, in motivating different parts of this uh, study. Um, so I'll talk about that and then I'll finally get to um, the actual data. Um, talk about that. Uh, there's uh, fMRI and behavioral as well as like mathematical modeling results to, to show. And then I'll talk about just the implications. <clears throat> so uh, for different theories um, related to like aging and decision making or learning, things like that. OK, so uh, I study decision making uh, in, the, in the laboratory. So I try to come up with uh, simple tasks that can tell us about the mechanisms of decision making, but you know, hopefully also inform us, you know, just more broadly about how we make decisions in the real world. Uh, so people often have to choose from multiple options uh, involving positive or negative outcomes. So we probably take it for granted, but we actually, you know, do this multiple times per day. And a lot of times, you know, these decisions are very uh, important. You know, other times they may not seem important, but we still nevertheless have to make them. So uh, what stock to invest in, whether to sell uh, when it's high or buy when it's low, uh, what product to buy so you can make, you know, these simple decisions uh, every day. Um, so, you know, what type of salsa am I going to get at the store? What kind of toothpaste? Uh, what restaurant am I going to go to? Things like that. And then, of course, um, a decision like how cold uh, of weather should you protect power plants against? So 
that's obviously uh, been kind of a salient one. So we, uh, you know, make decisions every day and they um, have more or less kind of uh, importance. So my goal is to kind of look at and examine specific decision making mechanisms that first can contribute strongly to behavior. So what are the key kind of um, psychological, neuro, neural and uh, mechanistic um, components underlying uh, decision making? So to look at that from kind of a cognitive psychology or cognitive neuroscience standpoint, and to just understand basic aspects about how we make decisions. And then I like to take those types of paradigms that, um, that I study and then look at how they can address questions relative to say individual differences, things like aging, um, I've done work on personality, um, things like uh, worry or externalizing uh, factors, and then also uh, just situational factors. So my lab has also looked at say decision making under pressure or under stress uh, so all these things are, are really important to look at. and i try to you know look at both uh, kind of some of the the main uh, components of decision making as well as more applied questions and then to do this i use a combination of uh, mathematical modeling uh, multi-level modeling and then neuroscience methods to sort of account for these effects in multiple different ways um, so primarily, or, or a big um, uh, part of my research uses reinforcement learning tasks. So sometimes these are called uh, bandit tasks, so uh, named after like a, a slot machine, um, colloquial, colloquially called a one-armed bandit. So uh, in an n-armed bandit task, you're say picking from uh, n different options and you repeatedly do that and then you receive uh, feedback and you're supposed to learn something. Uh, about which options are more rewarding. Um, so this is one example of just a, a simple decision-making test that we've used in the lab. Here you're given uh, a pair of two choices. You pick one and then you either get rewarded uh, or you don't. Uh, in this case, uh, participants would either receive one point uh, or zero. And at the end of the study, uh, these points would be translated into like a, a bonus amount or something like that. Sometimes we give a bonus, sometimes uh, we don't, we really don't find huge effects, but um, you know, that's an issue we sometimes uh, address as well. Uh, here's another example. Um, so in this one, rather than receiving binary or dichotomous rewards, uh, people pick from one of two options and receive points. Uh, so these are continuously valued. So they uh, can get a certain number of points. In this study, they could uh, even get losses as well as gains. And so uh, we just give people a goal and we tell them, you know, this is your goal. Try to figure out which options lead to most reward and uh, lead to the fewest losses. So those are the simple types of tasks that I, I work with in the lab uh, and um, the, the, similar to what I'll talk about today. So one reason that these tasks are uh, useful and one reason why I like um, working with them is that they're very amenable to formal computational modeling. So I view these models as theories of learning and decision making. So the theory, uh, you know, is in the model formalisms. It uh, makes specific predictions and so forth. Um, and then these RL tasks can be simulated with different RL models to develop uh, specific predictions about behavior. So that's another uh, nice component of these tasks is we can get these models and then we can actually simulate what they predict and then compare uh, how human behavior kind of corresponds to those predictions. So we can uh, make that comparison and then whichever uh, models predictions sort of uh, closely uh, uh, follow human behavior, that model receives the most theoretical support. And there's different ways you can test that. Uh, and of course, you know, the more that uh, one model comes out as the winner, so to speak, uh, in these different uh, methods of model comparison, the more, um, you know, the more reason there is to think that the theory underlying that model uh, is the best theory. Uh, and then these models are also useful for generating regressors, uh, both for fMRI analysis that I'll talk about today. Uh, and then recently I've also been using uh, model components to do, uh, say, multi-level regression modeling of trial level uh, behavior. So they're very useful for 
uh, addressing questions that you really couldn't have, uh, have addressed in another way without using uh, some computational kind of theory. Okay, so the way these models usually work is it's pretty simple. They generally learn an expected value for each choice option. So if you're receiving uh, points that could range, say, from negative 100 to 100 points, uh, your expected value for one deck might be that you expect to receive 20 points. Uh, maybe for the other deck, you only expect to receive like 10 points. So they're just actually like what you expect uh, to predict. Uh, if it's just a binary uh, choice task, then the expected value uh, is just your expected probability of reward. So do you think, uh, you might think uh, that you'll get a reward with a probability of 0.75 for one option, uh, but only 0.25 for another option. Uh, so those are just uh, what the models uh, learn, and, and they're pretty simple uh, in doing that, and they make simple and parsimonious predictions. Okay, so most uh, reinforcement learning models assume that these expected values uh, are based on average reward or recency weighted uh, average reward associated uh, with each option. So it's just how much reward on average have you received uh, every time you select these and they're weighted uh, a little bit by recency. Okay, so these are called delta rule models and they've been uh, extremely popular in uh, most modeling uh, formalisms uh, or most reinforcement learning models since basically the 50s. Um, so one, one thing that's been found uh, with respect to aging is that older adults are less sensitive uh, to differences in expected value than younger adults. So the idea is that younger adults might kind of use expected value, maybe these uh, average reward expected values. They might sort of, sort of use those expected values more so than older adults to guide their decisions. Okay, so in one uh, recent study, older adults only used a subset uh, of information compared to, to younger adults. Uh, and older adults have also been shown to be uh, sensitive to loss frequency. So how frequent do you receive, say, losses or negative outcomes when you uh, make a decision or select a different option, but not necessarily loss magnitude, okay, or how much will you lose? Um, so age differences in uh, decision-making tasks like these are often described to changes in executive function uh, and working memory. Uh, okay, so these are these changes in executive function working memory are then attributed to changes in neural processing in uh, different brain regions. So uh, the lateral prefrontal cortex has uh, been shown to uh, there's there's different neural processing with age associated with that. Uh, striatal regions, there's also uh, been been found less striatal activation, say in response to prediction errors, uh, which I'll get to uh, a little bit later. Uh, and then also more medial uh, prefrontal regions like orbital frontal cortex uh, and ventromedial uh, prefrontal cortex are all thought uh, to sort of change in how they function uh, as people age. Okay, so these regions are uh, basically considered part of the uh, striatofrontal dopaminergic reward system uh, that's processing effic efficiency generally declines uh, with age. Okay, so there's this other um, line of research that focuses on the difference between uh, average rewards, so how much reward do you receive on average, uh, versus the frequency of, re of reward, so how frequent uh, do, you, do you think you'll uh, get a reward versus a loss or a punishment. Um, so extensive work has examined uh, how brain regions track expected value, uh, but a lot of this work, or basically all of it, has used these delta rule reinforcement learning models that track average reward. So when we talk about these studies that have found uh, brain regions that correspond with tracking expected value, it's really expected value just based on average reward, not say based on the frequency of, uh, of how often you expect to get rewarded. Okay, and, there, and there's a lot of evidence from uh, cognitive psychology and kind of older work uh, that people use information other than just average reward uh, to inform their expectations. Okay, so people in particular are also very sensitive to the relative frequency of positive versus negative outcomes. 
Okay, so uh, in a recent study uh, that we did in the lab uh, with uh, Hillary Don, who's kind of the, the first author on uh, this, this study I'm presenting today as well, uh, we found that people prefer options that have been more frequently rewarded, even if they have lower average rewards. So um, I don't, I have some slides at the end if anyone wants to, to know more about this study, but basically uh, we showed two pairs of options uh, and, uh, that uh, differ during training. So people on some trials pick between options A and B. On other trials, they pick between options C and D, but we had more A, B trials than C, D trials. So then at uh, test, we um, paired option A, the dominant uh, option over B, uh, against option C, which was also dominant in training. Uh, option C had actually, been, had actually given reward more on average, but since it had been presented less frequently, people actually preferred the more frequently rewarded option A, even though it was objectively worse. It gave uh, rewards uh, with a lower probability. So there's pretty strong evidence that uh, frequency might actually be a bigger uh, kind of determinant of behavior than just average reward and that uh, a large group of people tend to focus more on how often they're rewarded than exactly, than particularly in, on how much they're rewarded. Uh, and so in contrast to these delta rule reinforcement learning models, uh, there's another class of models called uh, decay rule models, and I'll go through the model formalisms uh, a little bit later, uh, but these assume expected values are based on reward frequency uh, or cumulative reward as opposed to average reward. So the idea with this study is that if you present an option more frequently, even though it might lead to, to lower reward on average, people will tend to focus on that reward frequency. Rewards will tend to accumulate rather than, uh, than, than be average in expected value. And so people will tend to uh, base their decisions more on cumulative reward uh, than on average reward. So you can think about this uh, situation probably occurs a lot, uh, you know, in just in real life or whatever, uh, where the things you're deciding against, say which restaurant to uh, go to, uh, you know, when you have a, a night away or whatnot, uh, that might, th those options might differ in how frequently you've experienced them. So often it might be, do you want to say try a new restaurant that you've maybe only tried once or twice, or do you want to go to your favorite that you've been to dozens of times? So the, the idea behind these models is that cumulative experience you have and say uh, going with one option over another that might weight your decision uh, more so, or in addition to just the average reward or average expected uh, return on your decision. Okay, so importantly, uh, since a lot of or nearly all model-based fMRI uh, has, has been done using these uh, delta rule models that track average reward, uh, model-based fMRI using, say, uh, regressors from decay rule models they could show, uh, that could show different results than uh, just what's been shown previously uh, when only delta models have been used. So that was another uh, goal of this study was to try to uh, be able to dissociate uh, activation tied to these uh, two different models. And to do that, uh, we use this uh, task that's, that pretty much um, dissociates average reward uh, from gain loss frequency. So there's been a lot of work, um, a lot of uh, aging studies have looked at, say, uh, older adults performing the Iowa gambling task, uh, but the Sioux Chow gambling task, which, uh, you know, maybe you haven't heard about it, but it's a task, um, I really think it was well developed and it was uh, developed by a team from uh, Su Chow University back in 2008 to sort of correct for uh, an issue with the Iowa gambling task and that reward frequency was not neatly dissociated from average reward. So this is the uh, reward schedule right here. So this is just over 10 trials. Uh, we, give, we had a 100 trial task and it's just repeated. But you can see that these right here, decks A and B are considered the bad decks because over time they lead to a negative net payoff. So uh, they're, they're bad on average in other words, but they give frequent gains, so uh, they're they're very um, appealing at first, and the task is sort of, is very difficult because people tend uh, to develop a strong preference initially toward these bad decks. So you can see they give uh, small gains on eight of ten trials, 
uh, 80% of the time, but then they hit you with these extremely large losses on 20% of the trials. Whereas the good decks, they initially seem uh, bad because they give, uh, they give losses on 80% of trials, but on 20% of the trials, they make up for that by giving these uh, extremely large uh, gains. Okay, so overall, the good decks have higher average reward, but they have less frequent, uh, they, they give less frequent rewards and more frequent losses. Okay, so that's why uh, we thought this test would be uh, very good to kind of look at this dissociation between uh, average and uh, frequent reward. Okay, so people again initially show a strong preference for the bad decks because reward frequency is very salient. Uh, and the good decks seem sort of aversive because they'll give you rewards uh, 20 per, give you losses 80% uh, of the time. So we thought that this test could be useful for reevaluating how frequency and average reward information is represented in the brain. Uh, the ventral striatum uh, is thought to track average reward from delta models, so kind of a canonical finding uh, in the reinforcement learning and model-based fMRI literature is that uh, prediction errors in these tasks, so the difference between what you got and what you expected to get, uh, are um, tied to activation in the ventral striatum. So you get a spike basically when you get unexpected large rewards or a positive prediction error. Uh, it's unclear though whether this region also might track reward frequency. So is it uh, only uh, tracking some average reward component or could it also be uh, useful for tracking uh, reward frequency? Uh, and again, most model-based fMRI studies have only used delta rule uh, RL models. Uh, the lateral uh, prefrontal cortex was another region that we thought might uh, be a candidate region for tracking something like reward frequency. Uh, we know that it tracks outcome uh, uncertainty uh, it also tracks uncertainty about the current state, uh, and it's generally involved in, re in resolving conflict uh, under uncertainty. So one idea is that lateral prefrontal cortex may track reward frequency uh, as this sort of proxy of outcome uncertainty. So uh, uncertainty, in other words, might be somewhat tied uh, to how frequent you expect to be uh, rewarded. In other words, you'd have low frequency the more likely you think that you'll uh, receive a reward every time you pick that option. Okay, and then another uh, another thing we we're, were thinking about with lateral pre, uh, prefrontal cortex is that it's often seen uh, in, to activate in, in response to like working memory tasks and things like that. So we thought that that might be a region that uh, maintains working memory representations uh, of reward frequency. In other words, the lateral pre prefrontal cortex might sort of take an index of how frequently you've been rewarded uh, when you've selected each option uh, in the, the past several trials. So in addition to, to those issues of frequent versus average reward, uh, we're also interested in examining age differences and sensitivity to recent events. So this is kind of uh, another line of work that, that we thought we could look at uh, with this task as well. So older adults have been shown to be more sensitive to uh, recent events. They may sort of have this recency uh, bias. Uh, particularly, we found they're more likely to switch following large losses and then stay with the same option uh, following large gains. So this is like using what's called a win-stay, uh, lose-shift strategy. It's a strategy uh, that, that could be successful or somewhat successful in some of these types of reinforcement learning tasks where say if you get a reward that's maybe a gain, uh, you stay with that option. Otherwise, if you get a loss, you switch to a different uh, option. Now, notably, uh, this is a pretty um, simple strategy. You really only have to, uh, to know the, the last outcome in order to be able to implement this strategy. So it's something that could potentially be done uh, to uh, get around and maybe a more complex strategy that involves kind of uh, weighting the average rewards over many uh, past trials. So we thought younger adults might be more likely to use uh, recency weighted average for expected values. Older adults may generally be more reactive decision makers. So they're more likely to make choices using something like a win, stay, lose, shift strategy 
that's basically just dependent on the last outcome. So they'll stick with an option uh, as long as it's rewarding, but then once it's not, they'll switch to a different option. Okay, so older adults have also uh, related to this. They've been shown to be more likely to use reactive rather than proactive uh, cognitive control. So the general uh, kind of theory is that this is a qualitative difference in how older and younger adults make decisions. Older adults will be more likely to kind of just get in this Wednesday uh, loose shift mindset where younger adults, they may use that strategy initially, but they'll eventually develop some representation of the long-term recency weighted uh, average expected values. Okay, so these simpler uh, reactive strategies could be compensatory for declines uh, say in that frontostriatal network that mediates uh, this value-based decision making. And then another uh, line of research, so I warned that I would have to bring in uh, several lines of research, so here's another one, uh, but there's also been a lot of work uh, looking at uh, compensatory activation. So several studies have found increased bilateral activation uh, in prefrontal and parietal regions for older adults in uh, cognitive tasks. So often this is in regions like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, that um, you, you find this type of activation. Uh, so here, older adults will recruit bilaterally uh, in the same regions unilaterally recruited by uh, younger adults. So this, uh, this is suggested to compensate for age-related uh, neural decline. The idea is that the older brain has to sort of recruit uh, a broader network of brain regions to kind of uh, equal the output uh, of the younger adult brain. Uh, and then uh, this compensation has often uh, been uh, tied to improved performance. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, this issue uh, later, whether uh, compensation, whether improved performance is necessary uh, to call it compensation uh, or not. Okay, so we were interested in whether older adults would show evidence uh, of compensation in prefrontal or parietal regions, uh, in addition to the other questions that I've already uh, talked about. Okay. So for the current study, um, we uh, had a fairly um, good sample size. Of course, you know, how good might depend on who you're talking to, but this was one of our goals was to uh, get a little bit of a, a better sample size than say 20 to 25, uh, you know, in each group. So we were we, we targeted about 50 uh, in each group. So we got 53 uh, older adults and 53 younger adults uh, whose data uh, we could use. I think we ran a few more, but um, they were excluded for like motion artifacts or uh, things like that. So this was our uh, usable data set and they performed the Suchow gambling task uh, while undergoing fMRI. Okay, and so we used model-based fMRI to examine, uh, to, to basically compare younger and adult behavior uh, in this task. Uh, so just briefly, uh, to give kind of a, a brief rundown of how model-based fMRI works or how we did it, um, first we take the behavioral data and we fit our reinforcement learning models to that behavioral data. So then we can you know, do our normal model fitting uh, analyses and, and which I'll talk about in a few slides. Uh, but first we fit the behavioral data and then uh, we, get, we can derive our uh, model components, uh, namely expected values and prediction errors uh, that uh, occur on a trial level. So we can get these trial level uh, regressors and then use them, uh, use them as regressors uh, and we can use both average, uh, we use the average best fitting parameters to basically generate them. So uh, we fit the data, then we took the best fitting average parameters, and we really basically simulated each participant's choices that they made to get what would be their expected value for each option and the prediction error uh, on each trial. And we can get these for uh, both of the models that uh, we use, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Okay, so uh, this, this allows us to identify brain regions that correspond to uh, model components or to process, uh, processing uh, activation associated with these uh, model-based components. Okay, so model-based fMRI uh, allows us to examine how these model components are represented in specific brain regions, or this is 
this is kind of John O'Doherty's viewpoint. Uh, so which regions activate more when participants select options higher in expected value, say? And we can look at higher in expected value from two separate models that really make completely opposite predictions about behavior. Okay, so we can see uh, which regions are more active when people pick options higher in value compared to lower in value. Uh, and the value, of course, is uh, given by a specific model. Traditional analyses, uh, on the other hand, only tell us where uh, cognitive processes occur. Okay, and that's O'Doherty's view, so that's contentious. I'm not going to you know, argue it too much. Okay, um, but here is the task design uh, right here. So I've already talked about uh, the reward schedule. So again, uh, we, there are uh, two, good de two bad decks, two good decks. The bad decks give a uh, higher frequency of gains, but they have uh, negative expected value on average, whereas the good decks have higher average expected value, but they give less frequent uh, gains. So we're able to, to kind of juxtapose average uh, expected value from frequency-based expected value. They performed a total of 100 trials uh, split into two 50-trial uh, functional runs. And so this was just four uh, decks. They picked uh, a deck on each trial, and then they were shown what they received, and then they made uh, a selection uh, again on the, the next trial. So based on prior work, we predicted greater activation associated with expected values uh, in the ventral striatum and medial prefrontal regions. We predicted that older adults would show more activation in, in the regions corresponding to processing of reward frequency uh, than information on average reward. So uh, namely, uh, more lateral prefrontal cortex regions or what we thought uh, might uh, be represent or might represent reward frequency. Uh, we also predicted greater prediction-related uh, activation in the striatum, uh, which has been shown in a, in a number of studies. Uh, so one thing that's interesting about these two models that we use is that the delta and decay models actually have correlated prediction errors, so we can't really uh, distinguish their predictions uh, in that case, but they have uncorrelated expected value. The reason they have uh, correlated prediction errors is basically just because that's tied to the reward that they received on each trial. So if people get a gain, then their prediction error from both models is likely to be positive. And then if they get a loss, their prediction error from both models is likely to be negative. But they have uh, uncorrelated expected values, which allows us to kind of uh, dissociate activation tied to each model's uh, expected values. So here are the behavioral results. So uh, we looked at the proportion of optimal choices or proportion of trials that participants selected the good decks, uh, average across participants in four 25 trial blocks. Uh, and we found a significant interaction between age group and block. So that's just the uh, effect size. So um, you can see that younger adults right here, uh, they tend to uh, do poorly uh, at the beginning. So you can see this is 0.5 right here. So this would mean you were selecting the good and bad decks uh, equally often, you can see that even young adults didn't get uh, above that by the end of the task. So like I mentioned, this task is very difficult because people are so uh, sensitive to reward frequency and much less sensitive to uh, average long-term reward. Uh, so older adult, or younger adults did show some improvement over time, whereas younger adult, or older adults really you know, didn't seem to uh, change much. Uh, at least on average across the task. Um, and then to test whether older adults are more reactive decision makers, uh, we fit a multi-level logistic regression model uh, using ours BMRM, uh, BRMS package to the behavioral data. Uh, and here the outcome variable on each trial was one if they stayed by picking the same option that they picked on the previous trial and zero if they switched. So in other words, we are trying to test whether age and the previous trial's outcome interacted to predict like switching behavior uh, on each trial. So the previous trial's uh, outcome obviously is a good uh, regret or a good predictor for this because we would predict generally that people would be more likely to stay if they received a good outcome on the previous trial than if they rec received a bad outcome. 
Okay, and what we found uh, was that there was this general uh, tendency to, to be more likely to uh, stay uh, following good outcomes and be more likely, less likely to stay, more likely to switch uh, following bad outcomes. But there was also this sizable interaction between uh, older and uh, younger adults. So that's the credible uh, interval uh, right there. But you can see that uh, for older adults, there's this very steep slope uh, between uh, the previous outcome and their probability of staying with the same option uh, on the next trial. So this right here is what I mean by, uh, or what I, I take as behavioral evidence for the assertion that older adults are more reactive decision makers. Uh, they tended to uh, be very, their, their staying uh, probability is very tied to uh, the, the previous reward that they had received on the, the past trial. Whereas uh, younger adults, uh, they showed some uh, relationship between previous outcome and the probability of staying, but definitely not uh, as steep of a relationship. So younger adults are more likely to say withstand those frequent small gains that are given by the good decks uh, than older adults. Okay, so we fit the data with a delta rule uh, and then a prediction error decay rule model. So we had to uh, update the standard decay rule just uh, a little bit uh, to account for uh, gains and losses. Uh, but we basically uh, updated this uh, to also make it uh, completely sort of distinct from uh, the predictions made by the delta rule model. Okay, so these models uh, were selected because they make contrasting predictions about behavior. Uh, here's the equation for the delta rule. I won't get too into this because uh, of time, uh, but basically you take the prediction error, uh, you multiply that by a recency uh, parameter, and then uh, add that to the expected value on uh, the current trial, then it becomes your expected value on the next trial. Uh, I is just one if the, uh, that option was chosen, so you only update uh, the decks that you selected on each trial. Okay, and then the prediction error decay model uh, was from a paper that uh, another student of mine, Bo Peng, uh, published a, a few years ago. This uses a delta rule to track average expected values uh, and determine the prediction error. But then uh, prediction errors are only used to uh, update uh, the expected values from this model, which I call frequency values. So instead of uh, basing expected values on average reward, this model just uh, updates, uh, so it increments by one if the prediction error is positive, and then these frequency values decay uh, over time. So they're allowed to both accumulate if you tend to uh, get more frequent gains, the frequency value will keep going up, but then as you uh, select that option less often, it'll decline. And then if you get a prediction error less than zero, uh, then it will uh, decrement by this parameter right here. So this parameter was a loss aversion parameter, and we set that to allow that to go between zero and five to represent more sensi uh, greater sensitivity or less sensitivity uh, to losses compared to gains. Uh, so here were uh, our simulations uh, with these models just to show that they make uh, very distinct predictions. So we use parameters randomly drawn from uh, a uniform distribution and then uh, simulated uh, uh, these, uh, this, these models about a thousand times in the task. Uh, and this is uh, actually their performance. Uh, now this actually isn't probability of optimal choice. This was the old metric, uh, which ranges from, ranges from negative one to one, but one would indicate that you selected only good decks Zero indicates that you selected good and bad decks uh, equally, and then negative values indicate that you selected the bad decks uh, more often. So you can see that the Delta model, it learns the task uh, very quickly, and it predicts very good performance in the task, whereas this prediction error decay model, uh, it basically doesn't predict good performance because it assumes that you're only focusing on reward frequency uh, rather than average reward. Okay, so we fit each participant's uh, behavioral data to both models, uh, then just to verify that the expected values were not highly correlated. Uh, we looked at those uh, across subjects and then just for a subset uh, of participants. So this is the expected value from the Delta model uh, versus expected value for the decay model for individual participants. And you can see that sometimes there's like a minor relationship, but overall 
uh, it's pretty flat and these are uncorrelated. Okay, so uh, the PE decay model fit the data uh, much better than the delta model. These are the uh, Bayesian information criterion values. So a lower uh, value means a better fit. Okay, so you can see that both for both uh, older and younger adults, the prediction error decay model fit much better. Um, if we put if we competed a base factor, uh, it would be about 505 million, uh, representing the strength of evidence for the PE decay model over the, the delta model. So uh, it really outperformed the delta model because it doesn't predict good performance, and that's we didn't find good performance uh, in the task. So older adults uh, data were also best fit uh, by higher loss aversion parameters uh, compared to uh, younger adults. So they were more sensitive to uh, the frequency of losses. Uh, and this is uh, something that we found uh, in other work as well. Uh, for the Delta model, older adults data were best fit by higher recency parameters, suggesting uh, a greater sensitivity to recent events uh, compared to uh, younger adults. Okay, so we uh, simultaneously regress the whole brain activation on expected values uh, from uh, each of these two models. So this was in like the same uh, fMRI model, so this is unique activation uh, uh, tied to each model. So for older adults, we didn't find any activation that uh, uniquely uh, corresponded to the delta model's expected values. Okay, but for younger, young adults, we found uh, activation corresponding to the delta model um, expected values in the lateral orbitofrontal cortex, uh, the operculum cortex, and the insula. Okay, and then uh, we found uh, some activation that was greater in uh, younger adults and older adults uh, in uh, motor regions, the precentral and postcentral gyrus. Okay, but for the prediction error decay model, so the one that's especially sensitive, sensitive to reward frequency, uh, we found that older adults showed stronger activation in many regions uh, compared to younger adults. So particularly uh, greater bilateral uh, activation in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So that corresponds uh, basically with what we predicted for the task. We also found uh, some activation in frontal pole, uh, inferior frontal gyrus, insula, and orbitofrontal cortex. Okay, so note that these, some of these same regions, uh, like the insula and orbitofrontal cortex, those actually corresponded with delta model activation in uh, younger adults. So one uh, theme we've kind of found with the, uh, this data set is that we find some of the same regions that are activated in older adults for one model are activated in younger adults, like for a different model. So it's almost like they're using different representations to uh, perform the same task, basically. Um, so younger adults showed negative correlations with uh, prediction error decay activation uh, in several regions. So uh, activation uh, bilaterally in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex was negatively correlated with prediction error decay uh, activation for younger adults. So these regions were likely more active uh, when younger adults selected the good decks, uh, as these have lower expected values from the prediction error decay model. Okay, uh, prediction errors, uh, like I mentioned, were strongly correlated. So these are some of the individual plots. Uh, and so we just examined uh, prediction error related activation uh, separately in separate uh, MRI models for uh, each of these two uh, delta and decay models. Okay, so this shows um, activation corresponding to the delta model's prediction errors, and then this is activation corresponding to the PE decay model's prediction errors. So in younger adults, we see some of the uh, canonical activity that, uh, like in caudate, uh, the nucleus accumbens and putamen, corresponding to prediction error activation. Uh, older adults showed stronger activation in lateral uh, prefrontal cortex and parietal regions. Uh, and then younger adults showed also greater activation uh, than, than older adults in some of those uh, striatal regions. Okay, younger adults also showed a similar deactivation in frontoparietal areas uh, with increasing prediction errors, uh, similar to what we saw for younger adults with their prediction error decay uh, expected values. Okay, so I think this indicates, uh, this might indicate suppressing 
uh, responses to previous outcomes in uh, younger adults, which kind of corresponds to this behavioral difference that uh, we found. So these uh, regions might be active when older adults or younger adults receive large prediction errors or good rewards, uh, perhaps when they select the bad decks. Uh, so in other words, they might be selecting, uh, suppressing those responses uh, and focusing more on uh, long-term expected value than just that current prediction error. Okay, and then uh, older adults also showed uh, prediction error related activation uh, that corresponded with optimal responding in the task. So if optimal, if the correlation between optimal responding uh, and activation is necessary for uh, compensation, uh, then this, select, this suggests that um, it could be a compensatory mechanism. Okay, so I know I'm uh, close on time. Uh, so uh, real quick to, to wrap all this up, we found uh, prediction error related activation in older adults occurred in similar regions uh, as expected value related activation from the uh, PE decay model. So lateral prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, and insula. Um, so I think this is consistent with older adults using these short-term uh, reactive strategies to remember which options led to positive versus negative outcomes. Okay, it could correspond to maintaining information just about the previous outcome, and that's what you base your current uh, decision on. So younger adults showed the uh, prediction error-related activation that's commonly seen uh, in ventral striatal regions. Okay, so uh, participants perform poorly uh, in this task. They generally preferred the bad decks that give uh, frequent gains, but younger adults uh, seem to show some improvement uh, over, over time, whereas older adults seem uh, more reactive to recent outcomes. So more likely to switch following large losses and more likely to stay following large gains. And the model parameter uh, estimates uh, sort of uh, support this, uh, this finding. Um, so several studies have found greater avoidance of negative feedback in older adults. It supports the idea of a difference in strategy use. So Stacy Wood, uh, they did a study in 2005 with the Iowa Gambling Task uh, and found age differences in strategy use. And they proposed that uh, these differences reflect each group's strength. So younger adult strength uh, is learning and memory of average reward. Older adult strength is accurate representation uh, of wins and losses. So the PE decay model that uh, we presented here formalizes this latter strategy uh, for older adults uh, as the frequency of positive to negative prediction errors. So these two models reflect uh, very simple strategies in the task. Uh, they have a uh, few free parameters. More complex models might be able to fit the data better overall, uh, but uh, lately, I've uh, preferred uh, part more simple parsimonious models uh, for several regions. So first, they're falsifiable or they make falsifiable predictions. These models can't account for all patterns of human behavior. So you're able to tell like when they're wrong, basically. These models make different predictions. Uh, uncorrelated expected values allowed us to examine activation tied uh, to each. They're usually more generalizable to new tasks. Uh, models with more free parameters can overfit the data and then make incorrect predictions about uh, different types of tasks. Uh, and they have uncorrelated parameters. So in complex models, parameters can often trade off with each other. So the PE decay model represents a suboptimal strategy in the task, but nevertheless, it uh, is a strategy that's frequently employed by uh, participants. So older adults had greater uh, PE decay activation uh, in, uh, in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, corresponding to prediction error uh, decay expected values and uh, uh, prediction errors. Uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex might be involved in accumulating information about past positive outcomes uh, associated with each option. Okay, so I'll kind of skip ahead. Um, so yeah, let's see. I've already talked about this. Yeah, so um, as far as compensation, so from prediction error related activation, we found broader recruitment of prefrontal and parietal regions in older adults. Uh, and then activation in parietal regions is associated with optimal responding in the task. So uh, Cabeza and colleagues have argued that compensation must entail 
enhanced performance is, uh, associated with increased activation. Uh, but one thing uh, to point out for decision making tasks is that good performance uh, might not necessarily be objective. So uh, for something like a memory task, good performance is very clear. But for decision making tasks, uh, people could use different strategies and they can put a lot of effort into applying those strategies, but the strategy might not uh, be very good. OK, so to uh, conclude, uh, this task allowed us to neatly dissociate average reward from reward frequency, and we had models corresponding to each. Older adults appear to use different strategies, activate brain regions in different ways when making repeated decisions from experience. Uh, Frequency-based strategies are used when average reward information is unknown uh, or uncertain. So early in the task, uh, both younger and older adults use frequency-based strategies, but younger adults were eventually able to learn some information uh, about average reward. So I think frequency, a frequency-based strategy might be the default uh, until it is overridden by, say, attention to uh, long-term average reward. So thank you for uh, listening. And this, these are uh, my collaborators here, and uh, this was funding, funded by uh, National Institute on Aging. So thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, beautifully clear. And um, I'm getting some feedback here. Um, maybe people could mute if necessary. But anyway, uh, we have some questions. We started late, so we'll we'll take time for a few questions. We've got one here from um, Kendra who says, uh, "Was the best fit model consistent across individuals and age groups?" Oh yeah, um, yeah. Actually, it it was really. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, pretty much we didn't find any differences in um, model fit between younger and older adults. Um, I didn't look, you know, individually. There were probably uh, a few data sets uh, for like younger and older adults that may have been best fit by this Delta model. Uh, but overall, the prediction error decay model fit the data uh, much better. It's basically the Delta model can't really account for how poorly uh, participants did overall. So um, in the uh, the plot I showed of um, uh, performance, let's see, that's a few, but uh, people basically, you know, most people don't get above, say, chance or, or 0.5 selecting, uh, you know, good decks more often than bad decks, basically. So I think because of that, um, you know, the pr prediction error decay model really fit the data uh, much better. Okay, thank you. And um, it's a question about the task itself, um, which I can resonate with. I was trying to mentally imagine doing this task. Um, so the, the, the losses and the gains are enormous in relative to the, the regular trials. Um, so I guess two things come out. One is um, if you manipulate the serial order with which the first of these big losses or big get gains occurs, Suppose it occurred on the first trial or the second trial rather than after a lead-in. Do you think the behavior would be different? If I start this task and the first time I draw a card, I lose 1,050 points. Is that likely to bias how I'm going to behave going forward? And relatedly, do you not think with such large, what one might call oddballs, this reminds me of an oddball task where you get highly salient deviant stimuli embedded within um, much more frequent and less salient stimuli. Do you think that some of your brain responses might be triggered by something like an orienting response or a salience response to these improbable, very large losses and gains? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So. Um... Yeah, first, uh, you know, the original Iowa gambling task, I think, was developed basically with the idea that you would sort of develop, that the, the, it would start off kind of simple and you would develop these uh, expectations that were counter to uh, how good the decks actually were. So, for example, you, you develop this initial expectation that the bad decks are actually good mm -hmm. and the good decks are actually bad. Um, so that that was kind of I think that was kind of like the motivation behind for Bakara and, and all of them when they developed 
uh, this task was to set that up and then it almost creates kind of a reversal learning situation where you have to uh, kind of reverse these initial uh, tendencies. So I think it, it could be slightly different if you know you you move these uh, these rare options, say to the, the first trial uh, or the first draw from each deck. Uh, it could be different. On the other hand, um, you know, older older adults basically tended to keep selecting uh, these bad decks even when they would uh, get the extremely large losses. So it's not exactly clear that even if they got, you know, the these uh, these um, oddball sort of um, outcomes on the first trial, I think they probably would just tend to start focusing on the the frequent uh, gains mm -hmm. versus losses on trial two, basically. Um, yeah, that that's a good comment about the uh, the sort of um, unexpectancy of these these rare mm -hmm. events. Um, we didn't really look at that much at all, um, but that could be something you know definitely worth looking at. I, yeah, I can guarantee if you did an ERP experiment, you would find a, a huge P3 component mm. um, to these unexpected, in, to these infrequent events. People are really going to be orient, orient very strongly to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. One last question, this is from Chandra Malika. Um, how do these models work um, when we take into consideration the positivity bias that develops in with aging? Oh, the positivity bias. Um, yeah, that positivity bias is, uh, is a, an interesting topic. Um, and I, I kind of, I don't know if I necessarily buy the positivity bias a whole lot in these tasks. Um, so, you know, I tend to think that older adults have more of a negativity bias when it comes to, uh, say, outcomes from uh, different options. So I think, I forget if it was in the discussion or in the intro where I was, where I cited a few studies. Um, I, think in the, I think it was the intro, but there have actually been several studies that have found uh, older adults are more sensitive to uh, losses or negative outcomes. Uh, yeah, I think, oh, so it's these, yeah. So there have been like several studies that have found uh, when you're looking at like outcomes as opposed to say uh, just uh, perspective type of uh, decisions uh, that older adults are like more sensitive to, to negative feedback uh, than uh, younger adults. So I know uh, like Gregory Samanez Larkin, he had like a 2007 paper uh, using the mon monetary incentive delay task and there he found that like that that was like perspective where you were told, OK, you're about to receive a loss, basically. And older adults were like less sensitive to that anticipatory type of uh, loss aversion or whatnot than younger adults. But when it comes to feedback, uh, there's a lot of evidence that they're actually like more sensitive to, to negative losses or feedback than, than younger adults. So. I think that's, you know, it's a very um, interesting question. It's motivated a lot of research in this field, you know, over the past couple mm -hmm. of decades. Yeah. Uh, but I think there's this distinction between kind of outcome versus anticipatory um, loss aversion. Thank you. That's very interesting. All right. Um, I think we'll draw this stage of the proceedings to a, a close. Um, uh, for folks who would like to join us backstage, so to speak, uh, the uh, link is in the uh, Q and A um, um, function, and you're very welcome to join us, Daryl. I think we're asking you to stay on to be guided backstage. <laughs> um, let me uh, say thank you once again for an extremely clear and interesting presentation, and um, we look forward to seeing how this research program develops uh, in the future. So thank you very much and okay. I'll be seeing you shortly. Okay.